Okay, so today I want to go into a little bit more details now. So let's recall again what we have gone over. We've gone over this notion of some space, and at every point there might be a black hole somewhere over here, but at every point in space uh, we established a, I'll just get rid of this for right now, we established something called a metric tensor, right? But inside of here, I want to create a full-on picture of what's going on. We established that there was two different types of, of bases. There was the, the covariant basis. So like this is the dx1 position, the dx2 position, the dx3 position. So x, x, y, and z coordinate system. Similar here, there was the contravariant basis system. Like this. And we called this one here, uh, in this, this one here, we had the, these f, mu vectors, these are the components along each along each direction of, for this particular vector and in here we had the e mu vectors so these f and e these are just examples that i derived from a previous video because we can think of force we could think of a force vector as a contravariant vector those are the the components change contravariantly but its bases change covariantly together we, we can we can measure the magnitude of some force vector similarly with the electric field the electric field behaves contra or covariantly so this is on the bottom co on the bottom is sort of how i remember that and with this came the notions of the metric tensor right and we briefly went over what the metric tensor does. We're going to go in deeper. Uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper today in discussing the real, the, the real power of the metric tensor. So these guys here are what I, are, is going to, is what I'm going to want to focus on today. Okay. And then we're gonna then we're gonna redraw this picture at the end, and we are going to understand things a little bit better, hopefully. All right. So, if we recall, if we recall that the ds, there's there's some ds in here. This is like the vector we're looking at. This is the ds, ds, the mag, the distance of some vector. It could be the e vector. It could be the f vector in any one of these bases, but ds squared came from Pythagoras, and this is our modified Pythagorean theorem. dx i dx j i or summing over i and j, like this. And then this here is the dimension of our space. So D, so this is the generalized Pythagorean formula. Pythagoras, generalized Pythagoras, which is this guy right here. So this prescription will give us what the distance is, uh, some infinitesimal distance of our vector, or the magnitude of our vector. So the, again, this is the magnitude is a scalar value. And so we want to introduce now this concept of an inner product. Now the inner product, if you remember from uh, from chem or from chemistry or physics, this uh, this uh, this inner product shows up. In many many places, the inner product is sort of denoted with these brackets. And what the inner product does is it takes two vectors. So say e mu 
and f new emu or actually I'll do this uh, it takes two vectors emu and f new right and it will output a scalar well that's kind of what this guy did right here right this is this metric tensor served as almost like an inner product right so the, and there is a connection there is a deep connection between the metric tensor and the inner product and that's what we want to investigate today all right so sort of to kick start this let's start off by just considering this right here so emu right so emu d x mu and f mu dx mu. I want to consider these two vectors. One's a covector and one's a contravariant vector. In their full generality, these are the components right here, and these are the basis on the components. Or these are the basis. So this is the basis and the components on the basis for each for each each basis for each orthogonal direction. And E here, E mu, this exists in a space. This exists in a, in a space we'll call the covariant space, or V star. And F mu will exist in a contravariant space we'll call just V. Okay? And so what we're interested in now is the inner product between these two and what we're going to fill with but before we do that we want to define something we're going to define we're going to define this guy right here the Kronecker delta again j i j is equal to the inner product between two different types of bases the dx i and dx j okay so if we have, for example, dx1 and dx2, right? So this guy is a contravariant basis. This guy is a covariant basis. They transform differently. But the idea here is that this is equal, therefore, to 1, uh, Kronecker delta 1, 2. And if these two things are not the same, then that equals 0. Right. So this implies full generality between the basis of the contravariant of the contravariant ortho orthogonal system and the basis of the covariant orthogonal system. Okay. And this is the connection between the two. So let's go back to this guy here or these two guys here and we will now, given this definition, I'll erase this here, given this definition of the Kronecker delta, we can say, we want, to def we want to do this now. We want to do what is, what is this right here? Okay. Well, so the inner product, if you remember, if we have two vectors, the inner product is, it, it, this will spit out a, this here lives in the real numbers. So this, when, when this object here is applied to this object here in a specific way, we get the real numbers. And the way it goes like this. This goes far back to concepts in general physics. If I were to write this whole thing out like this, f0 dx0. So I'm writing, I'm just summing over all the bases. I'm going to assume that we're in a four-dimensional space, okay, starting with the, the, zeroth, uh, the, the, the zeroth basis. E1 dx1, F1, oops, 1 dx1, plus 
e 2 dx 2 f 2 dx 2 plus e 3 dx 3 f 3 dx 3. Okay. So, oh, sorry about that. So if we have now, so keeping this in mind now, we can rearrange this a little bit. We could say that E mu, or E zero F zero. So all this is equal. I'm sort of bringing this up here. I'm just rearranging these guys now. So the basis on this guy was this, and the basis on this guy was this, plus E1, F1, DX1, DX1, plus uh, E2, F2, dx2 dx2 plus e3 f3 dx3 dx3 like that so I kind of just re-bunched these. I moved this guy next to this guy. This is all multiplication. Things can be moved, moved around. All right. Well, these guys, these coefficients are just numbers. But if we remember, this here was the definition of the Kronecker delta, where these two guys, 0 and 0, they're the same. So ultimately, all of these guys will go to 1. And what we get is E0, F0. Uh, plus e1 f1 uh, plus oops, that does not look like a good plus plus e2 f2 plus e3 f3 and this is again this is just that we these are all numbers we can add them up and this is in our this is in this is a this is a real number so our one to be specific, this is a, a one dimension. This is just a single number. So we went from taking two vectors, taking two vectors, we can rewrite that, e mu dx mu, f mu dx mu is equal to the sum of just the coefficients, mu f mu, oh, my bad, uh, summing over mu. And we do this for the however many number of dimensions we have. And this is in the real numbers. So this is sort of a concrete example on what this inner product does. It takes two vectors and it outputs a, sca a, a scalar or a number that we could theoretically measure in some laboratory setting. But now I want to consider what if we did, what if we were interested in two vectors, e mu dx mu and e nu dx nu right. and we want to inner product that say with with f nu dx nu and f mu dx mu okay so in order to do this, we have to 
begin, we have to introduce g mu nu here. Okay, so what I want to, so actually when I'm talking about the inner product, I actually haven't formally invoked uh, the inner product here. I, I want to actually consider, before I actually consider doing any of these complicated calculations, I just want to take a look really quick. We basically, in this calculation, we said we took a, a covector and we took a, a contravariant vector. And when we applied those to each other, we were doing something like an inner product. Right, where the if you the inner product is something that sort of takes like two vectors and creates a number. When we have this covector here, this is a this is a covector, and we have a contravariant vector. Contravariant vector, and we apply the two in this way, we ended up getting something. If uh, we ended up uh, doing all this stuff, and we ended up getting something that was merely just a number, right? So we went from a covector. Again, I don't really mind repeating myself. To we took a covector and a contravariant vector. Contravariant vector, and we ended up getting a number out of this. And you actually find, what's actually pretty interesting is you actually find that uh, the force that a particle feels on when it's in an electric field this is actually, that there's a relationship, if I remember correctly, it's that the electric field is inversely proportional to the force by the charge of the, by, by the charge of the, of the particle. If I'm remembering that correctly. In other words, if we were to increase the force, I might actually have this wrong, but I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what the rule was, but there, there's a relationship there, and, the, and Q is a number, right? So when we apply the electric field, so when we apply the electric field, E mu, it's got some components to it, to the to the force that the particle feels. So the par a particle is in some electric field and it experiences some force, right? And the particle itself has uh, some charge. So we apply these two things together and I kind of like to think of it as applying the two vectors together. Now there's, speci there's a specific way in, in this case in which you do this, but nevertheless, when you apply these two things together, you get a number which happens to be the charge of the particle. So there's, this is sort of the actual physics that's involved. Physics that's involved when we can when we consider this generalization of covectors being applied to con contravariant vectors. So this is like sort of the math, and it perfectly maps on to the physics, which, in in my in my in my opinion is actually quite an astounding fact there that there is sort of this almost this one-to-one -one relationship between the the uh, phenomenon in a mathematical abstract world uh, to the physical uh, non extract and non abstract world and with that being said I want to consider now the I want to consider now what might happen if we consider two covectors. So if we were to consider two covectors, say e mu dx mu and e nu dx new like this so these are two covectors with their corresponding contravariant bases well we can do this same exact calculation up here where we'll get something that looks like 
e zero e zero dx zero dx zero plus e one e one dx one dx one and so on depending on uh, the number of dimensions you go the number of dimensions you're you're in but we don't have a definition for this the, the, there's the here we the Kronecker Delta here is 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 a is a relationship between uh, we need some these are two different objects here this is a uh, this is a, a, a contravariant object and this is a covariant object so contra and co variant object but in this case we have two contravariant objects so we cannot do this and we, we cannot just apply this in, in good conscience because this this is actually these are two of the same objects so we need to be able to say well how can we get this this thing right here how can we get this to a real number is there a way we can do this and that is where this guy comes into play g mu nu now i'm putting this in upper indices because we'll see how this works for um, the two lower indices here. So these two guys are lower indices right here. These two guys are upper indices right here. And we need this form to get this to go to, uh, that was my bend, to go to that. So this guy right here, this g mu nu is going to ultimately help us to get uh, a vector, a covector, and a covector. These are, I don't know why I circled that. I'll do that again. A covector and a covector to a real number. And so, again, with that being said, we can go on and perform this calculation. So I'm just going to erase a few things instead of going onto a different slide here. And as I'm erasing, I'm going to I'll mention that there is a need. So so the, the, this is the, this is why the this g mu nu becomes so powerful. This uh, it's going to help us in understanding how we uh, do some index gymnastics and how we can uh, lower and raise indices on vectors and covectors so what this so what we need to do is we need to consider g i j perhaps and d x i d x j so the basis on the since there's two indices here we need two bases and what and the, the, this fundamentally um goes into something what well, that's called the tensor product this is, is basically a combination of all possible combinations of the bases. Uh, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit deeper. But right right now in these in these starting videos, I actually want to do some calculations and I actually and then we'll back up a little bit and we will go ahead and look at some of the theory behind this. But what, so we want to apply this guy to e mu dx mu e nu dx nu. And so what we end up getting uh, is g0, 0. If we actually do this out in for some arbitrary dimensions, e0. And then here are our bases. So from here, we need a, actually, I'll do it from here first. So we need a dx0. Right. And then we need another dx at zero. That's this one right here. Yeah, not dxx, dx zero. And then this guy has a dx zero because we specified that this mu was a zero. So dx zero and dx zero. All right. So if I were to now say do have this guy be applied to this guy. 
and this guy be applied to this guy, then we can see how this is going to be really, really helpful. You, you can kind of already see it, where we will say that this is, we can do this summation even more for more, for more terms, so we can go out to like G33, E3, E3. Uh, we can also add uh, G23, E23. Three. And so we can consider all different possible combinations. But ultimately, these guys right here are actually going to go to zero because uh, of the Kronecker delta. The Kronecker delta is going to show up. Uh, this gij is going to show up. And because 2 and 3 are not equal, uh, we're, that's going to go to zero. And you can actually do these calculations out yourselves. But these, cro these, these terms where, uh, the, where these are not equal, are going to ultimately go to zero. And what we end up getting, well, interestingly enough, what we end up getting is a number, right? The, so I'll just do this guy right here. We have G00 E0 E0 DX0 DX0. And I'm actually being a little bit informal here, and I'm actually doing something a little bit incorrect, but we'll we'll go over that later. We'll <laughs> go over my incorrection later. I'm realizing now that uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm sort of being confusing in the sense that the, this guy here needs to be like that, right? But we'll, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Right now, I just want to show what these calculations look like, and then we have dx zero again this guy with another dx zero and we see that this here is a Kronecker delta and this here is a Kronecker delta and so what we end up getting is basically the summation of g zero zero e zero e zero plus we can do this for another again our the number of arbitrary dimensions that we're working with 1, 1, E, 1, E, 1, and so on. And this ends up being in the real numbers. This is a real, this is a real number. And so what we see here is that this guy, this GIJ, this, this GIJ right here, takes two covectors, right? So this is, here's a covector and a covector. And it takes us to it takes us to the real numbers. So this metric tensor takes two covectors in our space, or two two vectors in our covector space, or in our dual space. This is also called a dual space. And this is also in our this is also a dual space. So two vectors in our dual spaces, and it takes them to, it takes these two guys to a real number. And so we can see now why this is so important. So what I've put here now is basically a sum, kind of a summary of what I've went over so far. So we have these, so we had these G, this metric tensor, and it helped us take uh, two covectors, for example, or this one actually helped us take two contravariant vectors, like this, dx mu and f, new dx new and we had this object here this metric tensor made it so that it was possible to take two contravariant vectors and output a number and so this is, this is so but there's nothing again there's nothing stopping us from saying well 
if we had any generic tensor, now I'm going to actually make these some generic, the, just these some generic tensors, so I'll say T for some generic tensor, it doesn't have to be the metric tensor. I could do this with three vector, I could do this with three contravariant vectors. I could also do it with two or with three covariant vectors where these are in the in in the upper indices and it takes again this takes us to real numbers so this whole thing here it, even though this is three vectors in a tensor when this is all computed we get uh, we get a real number and similarly we can actually take these tensor we could take mixed tensors here again there's nothing stopping us from saying that we can take a, a mixed a, a mixed object here, mixed mathematical object, with with uh, covariant and contravariant components, such that we can do something like this. And again, these are all vectors, and this takes us to a real number. A lot of times in books, something that looks like this would be synonymous with something that has two slots in it. Right? In this slot, we put our covariant vector, so our contravariant vector. And then this slot, we put, we put some uh, covariant vector in here. Right? So these two are, this, are, are somewhat the same thing in many books. In uh, Meissner, Thorne, and Wheeler, in their book, uh, in their books on gravitation, and modern, and his, the the other book is uh, um, Blanford and Thorne. So Thorne wrote was involved in both of these books. Uh, modern. Uh, modern classical physics, I think is what it's called. Modern classical physics, both of which are very good books. I've read both of these books. And I keep on going through them. Because, again, these books here, are they're, they're, they're pivotal to being able to understand uh, some good in-depth physics, not just, on, uh, not just on general relativity, which is what this book focuses on, but also uh, also classical physics, and so there's also names for for these tensors here. So this right here is a rank zero three tensor, where the second slot in our naming scheme refers to how many lower indices there are, and the first slot in our naming scheme refers to how many uh, how many contravariant components there are, or how many upper indices there are. So we can have a mixed tensor here. This is a mixed tensor where we have one and one. Similarly, we could have something like T mu nu sigma, and this would be a rank, this would be a rank two, if I'm getting this right, no, 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 no. This would be a rank one, two, right, because this is the number of upper indices. This is the number of lower indices. And there is a difference. There is a difference between. So these are these are not. This is not necessarily the same thing as this. And we'll get into why why that why that's the case. There's there's an order to there's an order to the indices here. So again, this is not the same as as that either and we'll get into why that is the case later but again we have these tensors these are generalized tensors such that when we do inner products and to perform all the calculations we get we get these we get real numbers that we can measure right and so just as a couple of examples that you'll run into when you're studying physics these are some of the more common examples is these guys right here so this is our inertia tensor and usually denoted with an i and then we have our indices the energy momentum stress tensor is usually denoted with a t 
the Einstein tensor is denoted with a G. Our elasticity tensor, if I remember correctly, is a W. That's a, so sometimes sometimes they're they're not like this, but I think this is what general convention is. And then the uh, the famous electromagnetic field tensor is F. Um, and so the again these are all just these little machines, these little mathematical machines that exist at every point in space. That they these little mathematical machines exist in every point in space. So we have an I alpha beta, we have a T mu nu, and so on. We have all these guys in one point in space, one single point in space time. So this point here, point P, is a single point in time and a single point in uh, our three-dimensional space. All right, and within embedded within this point are all of these mathematical machines that help us take vectors to real numbers all of these guys will help us do that and so with that being so so, so with that being said we can begin to understand now what exactly these tensors are how we can picture them how we can sort of visualize them in this sort of way these are again. There's these. There are these little machines that take these little mathematical machines that take however many vectors you want and take them to real numbers. Now, imagine I were to say, well, what if I had t mu nu, t mu nu, and I'm operating only on a mu. I'll just put our basis vector here, e mu, because we also have to get used to this kind of notation. E mu, this is just, this is kind of the same thing as dx mu. But I, I, I want to play around with different sorts of notations so that we can understand. This here is uh, a basis. This is a basis vector. So if we have some, some space along this here, we might have our e1. Along this orthogonal direction here, we might have our E2. And along this direction here, we might have our E3, where E1, for example, is it's a unit vector in, our, in one direction. So it might look like this, right? Our E2 might look like this, if we want to picture this in sort of like a matrix notation, uh, 0, 1 zero and so on okay the number of slots in here defines our dim the dimensionality of our space but again so so if we if this here we all, we're only taking this guy we're only taking one we're only taking one object here and but we're we're using this mathematical machine, this this rank one one tensor, right? And what this is actually going to output is a covector, right? So this is going to be a covector, and at, say for example, it's going to be covector B, uh, not a covector, a contravariant vector, like that, and. E, actually, this is actually going to be a covector, right? Because this guy is going to sum over this guy, right? And this guy has nothing to sum over. So it, naturally, we're going to get something like this. Okay. So we can actually perform a, an example calculation with that. But before I do that, uh, I'm going to just clean that up a little bit. I'm going to say t mu nu is our generic our generic uh, tensor. And we want to, and we're operating on a mu e mu. All right, so this is going to equal t1 uh, I'll just say mu, and uh, we're going to have a1 and our inner product is going to be 
let's see here if I can get this right. Uh, it's going to be E mu and then our E new, right? If we can, uh, and actually I need to put a one right here, or mu's or ones in this case, E one. Right. Similarly, we will get plus T two mu A two E two E new like that. And then plus T three mu A three E three E new like that. And what this is actually going to, well, actually what I need to do here, I'm messing up just a little bit here. These guys actually have to be ones and twos and threes. But then we also have the basis vectors that are coming from here. So because, because this object here is a three, is a, actually no, it's a mu, nu, its basis vectors are dx, I'm, I'm going to do these, its basis vectors are going to be e mu, tensor product with e nu. And all of these e mu's are these guys right here all of these guys right here. But we still have these guys to concern ourselves with. And so that leaves us with an object with just these types of indices, which in that case is going to be our B mu E nu, like that. So we could see just from the simple calculation that this object, T mu nu, will take, well, it can take two vectors, it can take two, it could take a mu and b nu and return us a real number. Or it could take t mu nu can take a mu and output a, not a real number, not a real number, output b nu. Similarly, t mu nu can take b mu and output a, a mu, like that. Right, so this object here, the, these tensor objects, are mappings. And that, that, that's the key point. These are mappings. And I actually want to wanna make this a little... Uh, this is a very important point to make. These here are maps, right? There's, these things are maps that take us from objects to other objects, much like a map, like a, a t your typical, uh, your typical map, like an SGS map, or I forgot what they're called. You, it, it maps the real world you have some real world, some real world, and a map, with the aid of a map, we can get coordinates. At every point in the world. My pen's starting to bug out a little bit. But this, uh, this is the point. This is the point right here. These objects are maps, which is key to understanding tensors.